be it from work, from relationships, from study, or other sources, we're all exposed to some level of mental and emotional stress in our lives. While we can't always control those circumstances, we can improve how our bodies and our minds respond to stress. And a crucial aspect of that is through nutrition. Today we break down nutrition for a calmer mind to its three most basic components with the help of brain health expert, Dr. Daniel Monti. Which foods spike anxiety? How does brain inflammation disrupt calm of mind? And which nutrients can douse the flames? Join us to probe these and other aspects of nutrition for a healthy mind. Welcome to Vital Signs, where we learn how to get healthier from all angles, from the biochemical and nutritional to the things we do that nourish our minds and our souls. I'm Brendan Pallon. Dr. Monty is professor and founding chair of the Department of Integrative Medicine and Nutritional Sciences at Thomas Jefferson University. We're optimizing brain health and micronutrient therapies are among the specialty treatments offered. Dr. Monty, thank you for joining us on Vital Signs after all this time. Always a pleasure to be with you. I'm really pleased to have you on to talk about this topic because I see you as a doctor who's at the intersection of psychiatry and integrative medicine that looks at all these very promising, often natural ways of, of resolving things like anxiety, depression. First up, I want to start by focusing on supplements today. We've heard about different supplements like vitamin D, like magnesium, uh, omega-3 that can be helpful for anxiety. But if, if someone is having difficulty functioning, if, it's, if the anxiety is impacting them in, in different ways in their day-to-day -day life, could they really expect supplements to uh, have a significant effect on that? I think your question is really leading to the importance of the answer. Because anxiety needs to be addressed in a multifactorial way. Once somebody has developed true anxiety, then one supplement isn't gonna be some cure-all for it. You really need to take a whole life approach to it. I start by looking at any possible causes of the anxiety. Is there something going on in the person's life that is making their current anxiety levels worse? Oftentimes stress is a big contributing factor. And does the person have effective means, mechanisms of coping with stress or whatever the stressful situations are. And there's a lot of different directions we can go with that from meditation to even exercise, but also going back to the original question about supplements, diet in general, because people can be consuming things that make anxiety worse, such as substances that are excitatory to the nervous system, like too much caffeine. Oftentimes people are getting burned out and stressed and then they're looking to combat that with things that push the nervous system, such as caffeine and other types of stimulants. When we do this, then we're on a perpetual negative cycle. It can make anxiety worse. It can make coping with the stress harder and debilitate the person over time. So what, what does the diet look like? What types of things is the person consuming? So if somebody is eating a simple carb diet and grabbing lots of convenience, starchy, sugary foods to get through the day. They're going to have these blood sugar ups and downs, these spikes and then crashes. Those spikes and then crashes can contribute to a feeling of anxiety and also take away from the person's overall psychological emotional reserve. So we need to sort of think about those macronutrients. There's the macronutrients, so carbohydrates, fats, proteins, which need to be balanced because if they're way out of whack, that can also lead to some issues with anxiety. And is it a balanced diet in terms of that? Because we want to make sure that there's lots of healthy fat, to your point about omega-3 fatty acids, even if we have to supplement that healthy fat, because those fats are anti-inflammatory. You mentioned inflammation there, and this is something I, I see come up again and again in terms of brain health. We know that inflammation is a component of mood disorders. We know this. And in fact, even some of the medications that are used for mood disorders, for depression, um, are shown to have some anti-inflammatory effect, some of them. We know that inflammation is a is one of the culprits of neurodegenerative decline. 
We know that inflammation is one of the culprits of Alzheimer's disease. And inflammation is made worse by a lot of the factors that I just mentioned. In fact, some people are even calling Alzheimer's disease type 3 diabetes because of the big contribution of metabolism. But back to depression and anxiety, the same factors that make cognitive decline worse make depression and anxiety worse. And I say depression and anxiety together because the two very frequently go together. It's not typical for somebody to have, to be experiencing significant day-to-day -day anxiety, but have an upbeat mood. The two usually go together and inflammation makes this whole process worse. This is known. And so we wanna mitigate inflammation. And one of the ways we do that is with diet and making sure that we have enough of those anti-inflammatory foods which includes those omega-3 fatty acids that you mentioned, those foods that we know sustain us, those foods that actually contribute to a more anti-inflammatory picture, like leafy greens and healthy fats, because people tend to grab comfort foods. It's a negative cycle that I often am helping people to get out of, and we do it in a step-by-step -step way. And that's where there is a role sometimes for supplementation of the healthy fats, like omega-3 fatty acids. And omega-3 seems to be a really critical component of a good diet for general brain health, for countering inflammation and potentially reducing anxiety. But how should people be getting this? What is the, the optimized way to get the omega-3 that you need? So I'd like to get as much of it as possible from the diet, but I'm also a proponent of taking extra omega-3 oils in different ways. So in terms of the dietary sources of them, when it comes to um, animal protein sources, the preferred one is fresh fish. And um, there's some that are better than others in terms of having the omega-3 fat. Salmon is rather common when it's wild. It has better quantities of the omega-3 fat. There's others such as mackerel. But really, I tell people, choose the ones that they like with the preference being the non-large predatory fish. So things like swordfish are problematic because they have more mercury content, tend to have more parasites. So the less predatory um, fish, um, some of the smaller fish. Tilapia on the other extreme is problematic too. It's a smaller fish, but it tends to have more toxins than some of the other fish. But really, there's so many options. So whether you like snapper or bass or, uh, or, uh, or salmon, uh, ju just go in the direction of fish and in the preparation, add some extra olive oil because that olive oil, which is actually omega-9 fat, but still anti-inflammatory for a couple of different reasons, really helps with the overall picture. So I tell people, get ex extra virgin cold-pressed olive oil, put it on everything. And you can also get... Um, healthy oil preparations um, uh, in, in places like, you know, Whole Foods or health food markets. You'll see in the refrigerated section, they have um, omega-3-9 combinations that you can add to your food or add to your smoothie to make sure you're getting that extra amount in because it's hard to get enough. I add, I add some to my smoothie here and there every day. And if you're doing that on a, on a daily basis, if you're getting some fish and, and adding some quality olive oil, to different meals, would you say that's generally enough for the average person to take? That is enough there? for the average person. And then when you think about snacks, the person who's struggling with mood issues tends to, again, migrate towards those comfort food snacks that are really pretty bad for us and have lots of chemicals and blood sugar highs and all of that. If you can transition to things like almonds, uh, walnuts, pumpkin seeds, nuts and seeds, those kinds of things, not peanuts, you're gonna get more of that quality fat and also some of the other nutrients that are in those that have a stabilizing effect on blood sugar. And Dr. Monty, just before you were, you were talking about the, the leafy green vegetables, this almost seems like second in the hierarchy of what we need in terms of diet for good brain health. Am I right in that assumption? And, and also what is it in these leafy green vegetables that um, is so valuable to us? A leafy green vegetable is a complex carbohydrate. We often don't think of it as a carbohydrate because in the, uh, in, you know, in the colloquial 
uh, press, carbs are thought of as things like pasta, rice, or simple sugars. But just like fats, not all fats are bad. In fact, we want to get lots of good fat. Not all carbs are bad. And we want to get lots of the good carbs. And those are things like your vegetable sources, particularly leafy greens. Why are leafy greens so good? Huh, that could be our entire conversation, but here's a few reasons. One of them is that low glycemic index. So you can eat a bushel full of spinach and other greens, mixed greens, kales, um, you know, add some chard in there, things like that, and you are going to not affect blood sugar in any meaningful way because the glucose load is just so small. But the bang for the buck is tremendous because of all the nutrients in those leafy greens. <clears throat> Everything from your B vitamins to biotin to choline, the chlorophyll that's in the green, all of these things have all of the phytonutrients have such a powerful effect. And when we can get them raw, close to raw, or we put them in a smoothie, then all the live enzymes from those greens up, oh, terrific. And then if we're talking about some of the quote unquote cruciferous green vegetables like broccoli, uh, Brussels sprouts, kale, those have other types of values that normalize hormones and things like that. So the green vegetables, I, I, I you know, I have the saying, if it's, if it grows and it's green, it's good. Now I know there's, uh, you know, exceptions to that in the uh, illicit drug world, but overall, if it grows, it's green, it's good. And what kind of quantities are we talking there for the average person, Dr. Monty? So, to... It's one of those things that the more the better, because most of us don't eat enough of them. In fact, I look for innovative ways with myself and with my patients to get enough of them in because uh, sometimes people will eat a salad every day for lunch and you want to have really high quality greens for that. That's great. I, for one, probably won't eat a salad every day. I, you know, it's if I eat one, I want it earlier in the day. I, di I digest it better that way. And at dinner, you know, maybe I'll, I'll have a vegetable with whatever else I'm gonna have. I try to keep it lighter. So for me, I know that I like to get those greens in through a smoothie. And that's, that's me. But I, it, I find the mechanism that works for somebody. Some, some people like to get in a nice healthy bowl of greens as their lunchtime thing. Some people prefer the smoothie. Some people, they really want something warming, particularly this time of year. So we find, you know, really good high quality broths and then just, you know, lightly blanch those greens in it and mix it in at the very end and add some sprouts and things like that. And you're getting a lot of that nutrients uh, value that way. So you kind of got to find the way to get enough in. I've, you know, when you, when you say how, you know, how much is, is enough, the, the answer really is how much is too much. And I don't know the answer to that because... I've yet to see it happen. You know, people often tell me how, you know, they binge on a comfort food, but I've, I've not encountered too many people that say, boy, I really feel guilty because I ate so much spinach and kale yesterday. <laughs> it just isn't the, uh, isn't the issue. Hard to go to excess on, on that particular yeah, that's food. Right. How does diet and nutrition factor into your mental health? What kinds of things have helped you to manage anxiety? You can go to epochtv.com and find vital signs in the talk shows tab to leave your comments. Also, to get notice of new Vital Signs videos, follow me at Vital Signs Brendan on Instagram and see Vital Signs on X. We've looked at the, some healthy fats in, in terms of the, the salmon and, and the, the omega-3 that comes through that. We've looked at the, the green vegetables, the leafy greens, the cruciferous vegetables. If there was a third component to add there, Dr. Monty, to, uh, to getting the nutrients we need for, for good brain function and to hopefully relieve the anxiety to some degree, what would that third component be? So you know, in the perfect world, everybody says, oh, it's best to get um, everything from the diet. You know, the essential vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients that support cellular function of the body, including the brain. The problem is it's really hard to do that. Um, it's even hard to do that when you're being thoughtful about getting a lot of plants and having a plant-based diet, not necessarily a vegan diet, but a plant-based diet. And a plant-based diet is, is hard. Um, one, but even when you do that, you know, there's soil, de with, there's mineral depletion in the soil, and sometimes you just still can't get enough of one thing versus another thing. And we know that people who are stressed, 
uh, people who are feeling anxious, stressed and depressed, that they need some extra B vitamins and magnesium oftentimes. And it also makes sense to make sure they have enough vitamin D based upon clinical trials. So vitamin D, you're not gonna get much of it from the diet. You get some in uh, some of the aquatic foods you might eat, but unless you're you know, um, a, a Native American in Alaska, um, in, in some tribes where they eat, you know, very particular things, uh, your vitamin D levels are going to be hard to get from the diet and, you know, maybe even impossible. Uh, I would say that if we think about it, we fortify things like dairy with vitamin D, but as a country, we probably consume more dairy now than we ever have. And, uh, I don't think that's such a good thing for a lot of adults, but the vitamin D levels continue to get worse and worse. Because really the primary source for most of us of vitamin D is the sun. But that's problematic. You know, so you think about a full day of sun exposure without sunblock would be about 10,000 units of vitamin D. We don't do that anymore. We can't. We've destroyed the ozone layer. So, you know, we increase our risk of, of skin cancer. People are going to sunburn uh, because they're not acclimated to the sun. All of those other things are issues. So sun exposure is very limited. And so vitamin D levels tend to be low. When I draw out vitamin D levels, I look at people's vitamin D levels all day. The only time I see a, vitamin, a normal vitamin D level, as soon as I see a, a normal vitamin D level, I uh, ask the person, okay, how much vitamin D are you taking? Because almost never is that the case in somebody who's not supplementing it. And the vitamin D is important for cognitive function. And there have been studies that show that there's a synergistic effect with people who have a true depressive disorder when they take an antidepressant with the vitamin D. So we know that the vitamin D is important and helpful and we want to get enough of it. People often ask me how much to supplement and really, you know, the blood tests are the guide. So in the absence of having somebody that can help you get your blood tested, you know, the primary care doctors sometimes don't have time for it or it's hard to get an appointment. I start with, okay, you know, most people can safely take 2000 units a day. I recommend taking it with vitamin K because it, it maximizes the absorption and utilization of the vitamin D. And then I supplement up from there based upon blood levels. And I just tell people to use, um, you know, a reputable brand. Vitamin D is a little different than say botanicals, where when they analyze them, you can have three different companies and there might be highly variable amounts of the substance in there. Vitamin D, if you get something that's uh, a vitamin D that's third party tested, and there's a lot of popular commercial brands that are, the vitamin D, it usually has close to the amount that's supposed to be in there. It's not as critical with vitamin D to use only this brand or that brand. And I usually get it, the and, and many companies sell it with the vitamin K um, complexed with it. And that combination, I think, is the way to go. Okay. And uh, if people want to go to the extra, extra measure, they can get tested to see if they, they might need a bit more than the, the standard dosage. And I recommend it, especially for people who might be struggling. I recommend the blood test. Um, I, hear the, and I hear the price is quite reasonable compared to other, other tests of that nature. It is. But just know this. You might... It might be one of those things that gets, you know, if you have a deductible on your insurance for the year, that might be one of the things that has to be deducted because some insurance companies will decline it unless the doctor puts something on there that is suggestive of a vitamin D deficiency. And the problem is in medicine, we focus on deficiency, like severe deficiency, like so little vitamin D, you have rickets or osteomalacia. And in the absence of those kinds of symptoms, the insurance company might decline paying for the vitamin D level. And we tell patients that like, this is important to get, but you know, you have to be willing to pay for the test. Your insurance company might, might deny it. Good advice. Something important to keep in mind. Uh, the, the bottom line is always an important consideration, unfortunately, with, with these matters of health. Dr. Monty, thank you for so much for coming on and outlining three very crucial aspects of how people can Im improve their brain health and relieve anxiety, hopefully at the same time. It was a pleasure. We just probed how to get the right nutrition for a healthy brain and for offsetting anxiety with Dr. Daniel Monty. 
He's the CEO of the Marcus Institute of Integrative Health. You can click on the link in the description to find out about the specialty treatments they offer. Up next, speaking of healthy fats, what is the effect on inflammation, blood pressure, and brain aging of monarch of fruits, the avocado? Let's take a quick look. Avocados are stacked with health benefits. They're rich in nutrients that are often lacking in people's diets like magnesium, B6, vitamin C, vitamin E, and folate. You know Mr. AVO is only going to help chase the blues away. blues away. Find the link to that video in this video's description below. It's been great to be with you. I'm Brendan Fallon, and this is Vital Signs.